will trickle in. Um, we'll continue. Let me get on one side here. Um, I'm Grace Torres Hodges. I uh, practice uh, podiatry. I'm a foot surgeon also in Pensacola, Florida. Um, I have had a solo private practice since 2001. And in 2013, I was introduced to the direct care idea. Um, and I, it's, it's actually full circle for me to come here and talk to all of you. Because the reason why I went into direct care was that I listened to my office manager, who also is a broker. Uh, he was a buka broker for a while and no longer does that, but my husband, who's here taking pictures, I think. But, um, you know, so I'm, I'm actually the result of one of you guys. So um, your influence on the physician community is pretty big because you can see how physicians who are the ones providing health care can really make a difference in the whole thing. Um, and so I am a second generation physician. I have a, an internist mother and a general surgeon father. Um, I worked in their office growing up, so a lot of my business savvy came from them working in that office in what I call the heyday of uh, private practice before managed care. Um, and I, when I started, I started out like most uh, doctors did, um, thinking that I can hang a shingle after residency, and I did. Um, and let me show you what happens. So in the time from 2001 to about 2013, so many things changed. The most important thing for me has always been to take care of my patient um, because that's what you go into medicine for. And um, as the years went on, I'd see different things. And as a podiatrist, and I promise I didn't put anything gross on here, um, you know, one of the things that I deal with on a regular basis, I deal with kids all the way up to their grandparents. Um, ingrown toenails, very, very common in my office. And you would think, no big deal. It meant saves you a trip going to the urgent care. You get some a specialist to see it, um, taking care of that. But most of the times, I'll have people come in with an ingrown toenail on their right foot and an ingrown toenail on their left foot. And what will end up happening is, is that the question in my head comes at the time when I was still with insurance, I'm only going to get paid for one one ingrown toenail that day. But the patient came in with two ingrown toenails. Um, and I'll, I'll, I, I don't work for any of the insurance companies. I'm completely opted out of Medicare and all other insurance companies. And at the time when I was there, you have to follow the, the rules. But I never did that. I just swallowed the cost of not being paid for the second procedure because you just don't do that. Uh, so there was, they were beginning to already in, interfere with the way that I was doing medicine. Um, bilateral ingrown toenails, imagine if you were, if that was your kid um, and you couldn't get it done at the same time. Um, so there's some discrepancies with that. And everybody who's spoken before told me that this clicker sometimes doesn't work. Um, I deal with 50% of my patient population is diabetic. One of the things that happens with diabetes is that they develop neuropathy. They end up having pressure points that could potentially turn into uh, ulcers. Uh, calluses that turn into ulcers, which can lead to infection and amputation, which we deal with. We want to really protect that. Medicare has a program uh, called the Diabetic Shoe Program. And what you do is it is there to give pressure relief off of their shoes uh, and pressure relief off their foot. And so that they don't develop these things, the criteria for it is very specific. It's for diabetics. But this patient here is not diabetic does not qualify for that, but could use a special shoe to protect them from having some kind of ulcer here. When you start realizing that insurance companies have um, diagnosis discrepancies, they're being selective on what they'll cover and what they don't, what's best for the patient here was I needed a shoe. So I found another way out, and I was doing all these workarounds all the time. The thing that really got me over the top was since I do deal with a lot of patients that um, know me and have been practicing before I went into direct care, almost 15 years, um, what ended up happening was is that they call me, and back then, this is before the EMR and before um, even texting and everything, they'd call me, Dr. Grace, I've got this nick on my uh, shin, can I go ahead, can you, can you check it out? And one of the things I needed to do was delineate whether or not that had penetrated down into the bone if I needed to bring them into surgery. Well, 
okay, I do x-ray in my office, all good and well, but I needed to send him for an MRI. And I did outpatient, I wanted to send him for an outpatient MRI, and it had to go through pre-authorization. And if you, I don't know if you can read it, but the peer clinical reviewer, who I found out in the end was a psychiatrist, um, determined that the procedure was not approved based on the lack of medical necessity. Um, the left foot pain was there for two days, unable to bear weight, and there was an open wound. Apparently, they wanted me to, uh, the member did not get better after trying four weeks, four weeks of rest, ice, and compression, elevation, and four weeks of medicine. An open wound in a diabetic is going to turn overnight and can. So what did I do? What I ended up doing was I called my buddy at the emergency room, got him admitted through the emergency room. They consulted me. Remember, I was trying to do this all outpatient. They consulted me. I ended up doing the case in the operating room. The patient was flabbergasted. He couldn't believe that this is what was happening with his insurance, but he understood that this is the only way that we can get his leg and foot taken care of. Long story short, think about cost, outpatient versus inpatient, and then think about time. He was off of work. So in the end, what it really ended up being was that there's so much misaligned incentives with this. And what you have to remember is that the doctors are beholden to their patient, um, but that's not what the insurance companies are. They are beholden to their share shareholders. Um, in 2013, the thing is you always want patient and doctor to be uh, connected. This was the Affordable Care Act. You know where the doctor and the patient are? Right there. And, and I was in school. I finished in 98. I did my residency. I started practice in 2001. Um, I didn't learn any of these terms at the time. But they have become part of the uh, lexicon of medicine, uh, the business end of it. Nothing in that list has to do with the clinical care of my patient. And what ends up happening is, is that this is a slide, and I was glad that Nicole had it on hers. This is the expansion of that same slide. This was done by Citizen Health. Um, you can see the yellow line is the uh, cost of spending. And you can see each of the different uh, metrics that were added. The Affordable Care Act here, right, right around 2010. The red, the shaded area, is the amount of people involved in healthcare administration growth. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's this line right here. That is physician growth, okay? Physician growth, private practices and doctors, totally flatlined. For the last 40 years, insurance companies and third-party payers have been saying, you know, use our services, use our networks, we will able to cut down costs. Nah, not according to this. But the people that are taking care of patients, what you have to remember, there's a difference between healthcare and health insurance. Healthcare is what the physicians provide, the services and treatments rendered. Health insurance is a means to pay for it. It's a tool, but not the only tool. And that is something that we need to continue educating doctors educating the community about. And I know this group is um, very, very well versed in that. Um, when you see that flat line, it makes you wonder what's happening. And these are just the headlines from the last, uh, last four years um, about private practice. Is it dying? Well, let me tell you, no, it's not, okay? Um, but there are so many things that are, are making our doctors think that they can't survive and, and hang that shingle. Um, so the way that I'm approaching it, the title of my talk is, can we save uh, private practice? And our patient is the one in focus. Um, we, need to, we need to have that because, again, that is the health care, the people who are providing the health care. Most of us remember what our why was. We wanted to be this community doctor. I'm very blessed. I work in the community I grew up in. So I've seen my teachers. I've seen generations of uh, generations of uh, patients, but this is what we always kind of aspired to, a very classic Nor Norman Rockwell uh, look to it. But today's healthcare is very, very different. The majority of it is, as some of the others said earlier, the long wait times, I mean, just trying to get in. You know, apparently the statistics is, is that it's 43% of people say by 20 minutes 
they're, they're done with it and they, they don't like it. But that automatically puts the doctor on defensive once they start to see the patient. But what a lot of people don't realize and what a lot of doctors didn't realize is the behind the scenes of everything. Take a look at this. This is what we call the revenue cycle. Revenue, and this is what you would see anywhere in business when a customer comes in, in our case the patient, and goes through and has the treatment rendered and then is given an invoice and pays. That's all it should be. It should be this nice little circle. Uh, Nicole had mentioned uh, something about the authorization. That's a side thing here of things that we had to take care of in order to get like an MRI or any kind of uh, prescription for our patient that we're not getting reimbursed by anybody because of it. Um, and then with regards to uh, what actually happens afterwards, you, you never know where it's gonna go, but everything that was um, delaying things had to do with things associated with insurance. Um, Doctors know this, and everybody seems to have realized this. This was the uh, report by Medical Economics uh, in 2018. Seven of the nine things that are ruining medicine happens to be insurance-based. Um, again, I agree with uh, Nicole, not physician burnout, but one of the things that makes us upset, or not upset, but worried about this, is our next generation. We are a see one, do one, teach one, apprenticeship type of training. The thing is we were conditioned to conform to things. And after, at the end of residency, what we were told was that in order to see patients, we need to sign on. This is stuff that you can tell new doctors, existing doctors, you don't have to do any of this in order to survive. Uh, it's not true, you will get paid if you, if you put yourself out there. But we followed, we complied, because we were conditioned to do that. And it makes you wonder who's actually running the practice. Um, administrative burdens, we know that that's a problem. The compliances, and when they say that they're not treating patients, when the authorizations have negative incomes, 92% of doctors realize that. 78%, that's over, three out of four patients are postponing or abandoning their treatment. And the financial strain on a small business, which is what a, a uh, private practice is, the most recent uh, change healthcare debacle, and these are friends of mine who have private practices, 80% of people during that time lost revenue in their practice. 36% 36 payment, 36 of payments were actually suspended. They're not gonna get that back. And 55% of the doctors who had private practices had to fund it themselves. That is stressful. And that is what was uh, creating a lot of problems when the doctor thinks that they are the only ones in the room, all of this is happening at the same time. And so we really need to be looking for ways to, to change that. But the root cause is actually in the schools because when we talk to final year residents, what we're noticing is that 68% of them are being hospital employed. I am trying to reach out and I would, I'm asking for help to reach out to these folks right here who will partner with another physician or go solo because that's where we can make a real difference in those that are providing healthcare. There is uh, no autonomy when they join the hospital. The little beast comes in there again and it acts like the middleman. The incentives are all misaligned with that. Um, and you can, you've heard all of these before. Um, what you have to remember is that there's no one that wins in a third party payer system, only the insurance company. It's like the casino, the house always wins. And uh, at the most recent FMMA uh, Oklahoma meeting, I'm actually quoting Dr. McCary here. He said, they are the classic um, antagonist and agonist. They are the fireman and the arsonist at the same time. They're creating the problem. Um, they've removed all the market forces that a private practice, a small business, a physician can take care of. And um, this is not healthcare, this is sick care, and we're trying to find that alternative way of trying to treat it. Um, direct care is the way that we are looking at it. I have a direct specialty care practice, non-membership. I uh, have all my prices listed out there. I basically did this uh, presentation right now as a soap note. And so this is the way I think. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid the extinction of uh, private practices and we want to save the private practice. That is our uh, plan of action uh, here. And one of the things is that people or doctors have been told 
that we can't manage anything, that's the reason why I wrote this book. And so one of the things that people are, are always asking me is how do you stay uh, stable in this? This is my practice. I'm gonna give you a couple stats here. This is when I was still in insurance and you can see the mix over here. And as time went on, I started dropping insurance companies and you can see my threshold of, of, of break even is right here. I was always a little bit ahead of it, but the reimbursement rate, I was only receiving 61% of every dollar I was charging. Now I'm receiving 94.2%. And over time, my overhead was also going down. What I also did was I didn't have to see patients as often because the patients were more responsible. They had accountability. My practice is accessible because anyone can come to it. Um, I, we ask the referral uh, physicians, just let the patient choose. Really, that what is what it comes down to. It becomes affordable because all my prices are on my website. And so they can actually budget. And one of the things I was talking to someone earlier we barter. I live in a farming community. I get paid by eggs and by um, eggs and by corn and by fish because we live on the sea, on the coast also. So there's a lot of different ways. Or you can make payment plans. No insurance company is going to do a payment plan um, with time. And I'm available I, during lunch. I was answering texts. You know, so there, I don't have the numbers of patients that I'm seeing as much. You can see the drop in the number of encounters per year that improves. And so. I, I write a lot online about, about this, um, and it's a win-win. When someone, one of the beautiful things about this movement is the fact that direct care is win for the doctors, for the patients, and the whole community. And so that there's a healthy prognosis if we can get this going. I ask all of you to consider that also. Um, you can easily see how it all fits in together beautifully. We have to be that bridge between physicians and employers and the patients uh, who are their employees, education is key, okay? Um, if you want to learn more about it, again, Pensacola, we're on the Gulf Coast. We are in central time zone, by the way. I'm closer to New Orleans than I am to Disney. Um, we are home to the Blue Angels. Uh, very proud of that. But my QR code is, I leave it up there so that if anyone wants to contact me, I ask that you maybe consider sharing a book to any of your physicians that you're trying to get on your plans because there is a way and the community for direct care is very, very supportive. So I thank you for letting me talk with you today and I think I'm done with that. Thank you.